as a veterinarian and veterinary geneticist, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, you're, you know, you're, you're all about health, but you forget that I'm also a breeder and uh, a lover of, of uh, purebred dogs. And, and so I, I certainly recognize that it's not all about health, health, health. It, it's, it's about breeding a quality dog. There, there are plenty of healthy mutts out there, okay, but they're not, they're not a, a, a wonderful specimen of a breed that you're going to work to get for generation after generation, and, and that's really the goal of what we're doing. So, so let's talk about what the breeding goals are for a breed and for a breeder, and the goal is to maintain and enhance the quality of the breed. Okay, so, so we are looking to breed an entire dog. We're not looking to breed an eye or a kidney or, or whatever. We're, we're looking for a, a, an entire Basenji. Um, we don't want to limit the genetic diversity of the population, and that's something that we talked about in the first half. And then, you know, equally important along that line, then, as we're trying to enhance the, the quality of the breed, is to, is to manage genetic disease. And, uh, and I use the word manage because we, we talk about genetic disease control. We use the word control all the time, but we're, we're actually not very good at controlling genetic disease. Genetic disease kind of controls us a little bit, but we certainly are good at managing, can be good at managing, and can be better at managing it. And, and can genetic disease be completely eliminated? You know, yes, it, it, it can be possible over generations, but if you try to eliminate it, too quickly, you're going to eliminate the quality of your breed as well at the same time, especially for dispersed genes. And so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so, so in the immediate term, in terms of this generation, this next breeding of yours, what do you want to do for genetic disease control? Um, you don't want to produce affected dogs with genetic disease. That, that's your number one goal. And it's a lot easier goal to make. Uh, is to not produce effectives and therefore not, you know, not have disease presence in the dogs that you produce. And then the secondary goal is to decrease the frequency of carriers of defective genes um, over generations. Um, but carriers are important members of your breed as well. And once we have genetic tests, can be used to maintain the quality and diversity of your breed if they are quality carriers. So we'll talk about using carriers as well. And you have enough genetic tests now that you absolutely need to be looking at things in that way. Uh, so let's talk about genetic tests. Um, so here's our next poll question. And this is an open, this is an open poll question. It's not a multiple choice. So actually, let me start it first. OK. So. If you're using the web page, polyb.com slash jbell, you're just going to type in your answer, what genetic screening do you do in your dogs? If you are texting, you're texting to the address 22333, and you're going to put in the, the, the term G-test, genetic test, okay? Space, and then anything you type after that space is going to come up on the screen, and then, and then just hit enter. So either just type it in under polyb.com slash jbell or, or type text in gtest space and then your answer and it'll come up there. So we've got one person put in eyes and Fanconi. And you can put in multiple tests if you're doing multiple tests. Hip, PRA, Fanconia or Fanconi, prayers, thyroid, all available, not all available, because the Jesus that your breed doesn't have you on each other. <coughs> Cardiac, still see some people texting. Fanconi, eyes and hips. Eyes, thyroid, Fanconi, and hips, which I think is your chick requirements, but we'll go over that. Fanconi, PRA, hips, elbows, other eye, Fanconi, PRA, hips, patellas, Fanconi, PRA, um, hips, cardiac. All right, so, so we've got common themes here, patellas, 
Uh, so you're, you're pretty much covering the bases of the things that you do see in your breeze, some of them at much higher, um, some of them much lower. Uh, you know, you're not seeing um, pyruvate kinase on the list here because that is a disease that, that the breed did, did virtually get rid of um, very early on. Even before you had the DNA test, you got rid of it with the enzyme test. Um, and, uh, um, and hopefully didn't harm the breed by doing that, but we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Okay, so let's talk about what types of genetic tests there are. We have tests of the genotype, which are direct DNA tests for liability genes. So this is like the, you know, what you now have for Fanconi, what you have for, uh, for the PRA, um, you know, and so forth. It's a test for the mutation. You have definitive, normal, carrier affected, no question about those answers. Um, the uh, uh, tests of the phenotype, tests to primarily identify clinically affected individuals. So you run a thyroid profile, you're actually looking to find out if the dog's affected or not. You've got no idea whether it's carrying genes for thyroid or not. Um, same thing with hip dysplasia, the same thing for these other tests of the phenotype where you're testing for what the dog looks like or what the dog is expressing, but not necessarily what genes it carries. And then pedigree analysis helps us out a lot in identification of carrier risk based on the knowledge of carrier and affected relatives. And this is what really helps us for selection, especially for complexly inherited disease, such as hip dysplasia and so forth, and we'll be talking about that. So let's talk about direct gene tests. So these are direct measurement of the genotype. It's specific for a gene mutation. So your PRA, the Vicente PRA um, gene test is not gonna work for PRA in, in many other breeds, there are a couple of breeds that share the mutation, but, but not many. And, and the other PRA tests aren't going to work for the Vicente because it's not testing for the mutation and the gene specifically that causes PRA in your breed. Um, it can identify normal care and affected. It can be run at any age, regardless of the age of onset of the disorders. So you don't have to wait for the onset, like with a phenotypic test, where you constantly are doing thyroid profiles, looking for, for hypothyroidism or or so or you know it's got to be over two years of age for hip x-ray or something like that we run on, on puppies before they're sold to a pet or breeding home you know so you can find out genotypically what's going on immediately um, most direct gene tests are the sole and direct cause of a simple mendelian condition so they're definitive there's no wiggle room on it but we're seeing new tests come out, and none of them that you have for your breed yet, but that they will be coming, so it's something we need to talk about. There are direct gene tests for susceptibility genes that provide liability for disease. And now we're talking about complexly inherited disease, where multiple genes have to combine to cause a disease process. Um, some of these susceptibility genes are absolutely necessary for a disease condition to occur. So for instance, in cord one PRA, which occurs in miniature, in, in miniature dachshunds and English Springer Spaniels, they have a genetic test, and, and for dogs to have that genetic disease of, of, of PRA that causes blindness, they need two copies of that gene pair. But not all dogs that have that, those two copies develop blindness. And in, in the English Springer Spaniels, um, about 80% of the breed carries, carries those genes. So it becomes much less of a selection tool, because if you throw out 80% of the breed, yeah. you're gonna throw out your breed. Okay, so, so you know, in a breed where the percentage, you know, the percentage is very low and, and is closer to the frequency of effectives, so that the percentage of homozygous testing dogs and percent of affected dogs are very close to each other, then yeah, you've got some selective pressure there, but if the percentage of the gene is here and the percentage of the disease is here, selecting based on that, just that gene, is not gonna be beneficial to your breed and controlling that disorder. Yes, you can prevent the disorder, but you can also prevent the breed. Um, degenerative myelopathy in many breeds is like that as well, and so I, and I'm constantly talking to, you know, boxers and shepherds and Rhodesian Ridgebacks here, you've got breeds where the frequency of that gene is so high that it really, it's useful as a diagnostic test because sometimes dogs with, with severe arthritis in the back, you know, look like degenerative myelopathy. And, uh, and if you run the test and they're, and they're homozygous for the degenerative myelopathy gene, then you've got a greater chance of saying, well, it suggests that it could be degenerative myelopathy. And if they don't have two copies, then you can say absolutely that it's not degenerative myelopathy because 
those genes are necessary for the disease. You don't have dogs with degenerative nerve myelopathy that don't have two copies of a mutated SOD1 gene. Okay, so it's helpful for diagnostics, not so helpful for selection. Then, even messier situation, there are susceptibility genes that produce increased risk but are not necessary for the disease, okay? So now you've got you know, different combinations of, of genes that can cause the same disease, but you can have different combinations to cause it, and, and they don't need every single one of those liability genes. And so uh, the test for anal bronchiolosis or perianal fistula in German Shepherd dogs, and for, and for pug dog encephalitis, which causes seizures and, and death in, in pugs, they have a genetic test for it, and if you have one copy of that gene, you've got a three times greater liability of developing the disease. If you have two copies of that defective gene, you've got a 15 times greater liability of developing that disease. But there's still pugs that get, that get pug dog encephalitis that have no copies of, it, of that gene. So, so, you know, it's a liability gene, and it's helpful, especially in families that already have a high frequency of the disease. That, that's the other time that I would use those tests. Even though the frequency of the gene is so high, if, if you have first degree relatives that have degenerative myelopathy, then you know in that family, they already have the other genes that are necessary to cause the disease. And therefore, selecting against homozygous dogs for, the, for that SOD1 mutation is going to help prevent the disease in that family. But in other families where you don't have any close known close relatives with the disease, selecting against those dogs and saying don't breed them is just harming the gene pool at that point. So, so it, genetic test interpretation is getting harder and harder. And this is something that we as geneticists are dealing more and more with, especially with all these new commercial labs coming out, because they're just looking to make money running tests and they really don't have the wherewithal to understand how these test results should be utilized. And, and so you have people making wrong decisions um, based on those test results. Aside from the fact you also have commercial apps just giving the wrong test results, which is also a big issue that we're trying to deal with um, worldwide right now, right now. Okay, so in order to understand about direct gene tests, we need to understand that the different ways that those tests are developed. And the first way is a candidate gene approach, where a researcher says, okay, you've got PRA, and it's a degeneration of the retina. We know these genes are, you know, are necessary for a healthy retina, and let's look for mutations in those genes in, in blind dogs and see if we find a mutation. And if we're lucky, then yes, we've got a mutation, we've got a genetic test. So, so most of the genes found in the candidate gene approach are through luck. You know, through picking the right gene and finding mutation, and uh, and that's uh, you know the way that those have been done. And then you have a direct gene test, um, and then once you have a direct gene test, then you probably know about this stuff here. So this is for a recessive disease. The normal phenotype is this uh, like mauve color here, and the affected phenotype is this purple color here. And so you have two dogs phenotypically normal that were bred together with an autosomal recessive gene and they produced effectives, so you knew that they were carriers. Um, and so you've got some affected offspring and you've got some normal offspring and you don't know, you know who, who's carrying genes or what. Um, and this was before genetic tests came out and this is actually a late onset disease. So in actuality, they picked this pretty little girl here as, as their best bitch for breeding and they bred her to a phenotypically normal male. They, she was phenotypically normal at the time because it was a late onset disease and luckily they didn't produce any effectives. And now a, a genetic test comes along, we can test everybody and find out what they were. Well, we already knew that the two parents were carriers, were phenotypically normal carriers. They had one copy of the normal gene and one copy of the defective gene. We know that this affected male here had two copies of the defective gene. We know that this female here has two copies of the normal gene. She's genetically normal. Uh, this male was a carrier, and we knew that this, no, this female that came down with the disease late on uh, had two copies of the defective gene. Luckily, she was bred to a homozygous normal dog, and all of their offspring were, had to be carriers. It's the only thing that could come from a homozygous normal to a homozygous affected mating. So, you know, so all of you would say, well, you know, what's going on? Well, this, this female here is the one that should be used for breeding, okay, because she's, she's genetically normal, but she's ugly. <laughs> so, 
and runs backwards through the agility course. So, so you know, this is what we deal with with, with dog breeding. It, it's not as easy as saying we'll just breed normal dogs because, because we're breeding for a quality percentage. We're not just breeding for a test result. And so, you know, obviously this was the pretty little bitch that you wanted to carry on um, those genes, and maybe we wouldn't have bred her if, if we knew that she was infected. Um, but in the long run, what have we got? You know, we've got some, you know, we've got carrier offspring out of her, and if any of those um, offspring have the quality that she has and quality that we want to carry on, then we absolutely should use those carrier offspring, use quality carrier offspring. So once you have a genetic test, well, I'm repeating, it's going to be repeated again later on. So even if you forget it now, 20 minutes from now, it's going to be ready to do it again. So you have quality carriers, you have to use them in your, in your breeding programs. And if you have a genetic test, you know you're going to breed them to a normal. You're never going to produce affected offspring. And you want to eventually replace your quality carriers with a normal, normal testing offspring so that you lose that one gene without losing the quality of the line of what you have been doing and trying to be doing. So these two generations are four. It, it could take, it take many generations, and it could take you know you could breed a normal to a carrier and get nothing that you like, and then have to breed you know and breed again, and, and that happens whether we have a test or we don't have a test. You know, and, and we all know that that's what it is. You know, you know the amount of planning that we put into matings, and then what comes out of it, what we actually select. Most often, don't coincide with each other. Not an exact science. You know, it is not at all. So we have a lot of direct gene tests, and uh, and you have a couple in your breed. Um, you've got your PRA, you've got your Franconi, you've got your uh, Parvate kinase, but they developed the test after you pretty, you know, almost eliminated it anyway. Um, so you've got a couple of, of diseases uh, that you do work with there. So the linked marker-based tests, you have a lot of, um, of experience with that as well, and, and this is something a lot of breeds are struggling with, is that it's not an actual mutation that has been identified. It's a genetic marker that lies on a chromosome close to the defective gene, but that defective gene has not been identified. Okay? And, and the problem with linked marker-based tests is that you can get false negative and false positive results. And the reason for those false results is due to crossover during meiosis or the formation of egg and sperm. And this is something you learned in high school, so, so we'll go over that with you. Um, so, but the results have to be reviewed in light of the known disease incidents in the family. Because once a crossover occurs, it's giving you false results. All descendants from, those, from, that, false, uh, from that crossover will have that false result. You don't lose it, you just carry it on forever. Um, and so all commercial linked marker-based tests have high accuracy, but they, and they're better than no tests at all, and, and the researchers can tell you it's 90% or whatever based on statistics, but it's still going to have some false results. And, uh, and we, we, you know, I know personally we saw that with the first linked marker test that came out, which was, was copper toxicosis with other terriers, and we knew which families you know, when you saw a result, you looked at the family and you said, okay, that's, you, know, you need to look at, at the families because this could be a false result. We knew which families had ancestral crossovers that were producing those false results. So you knew based on the pedigree whether you had to question that result or not um, in that regard. I'm not sure if that occurred with your link marker test or the synergy as well, but that's something we deal with. Um, so, but this is how we're identifying genes now. It's through these association studies where they have these gene chips that have 20,000 or more um, markers that are spaced across the, across the chromosomes, and they have affected dogs with a recessive disease where they know that it has two copies of, with the mutation. They have phenotypically normal parents of affected who, where they know that these dogs are heterozygous. And then they have dogs that are normal based on not being related to, to um, affected dogs or dogs that have been bred to carriers multiple times that have never produced affected. So statistically, we're fairly certain these dogs are homozygous normal. And then you run the gene chip chips on enough of these dogs, and you let the computers figure out where the linked marker is that, that most travels and coincides with the disease, and then you've got a high, hot point for a, a linked marker. And with today's medicine, um, 
we know enough about the genomes that once they find a linkage, sometimes it only takes three to six months to actually find the gene. And so they don't even offer link marker tests. They just, they just offer, they find the mutation, and then you've got your, your direct gene test. But there are still some diseases where that gene has not been identified. No one knows what, what gene it is or, or what the special effect of that gene is or what system it actually does um, have uh, uh, cause uh, changes in. And so it can still take a lot. And sometimes they're in regulatory genes. So, so those are really all sorts of new stuff that we're dealing with that turn on and turn off genes that are located somewhere else. And so, uh, so there are still link marker tests that are coming out. They're going to be out there, and you need to understand how those work. So, this is, you know, my trying to put markers on the chromosomes, and my finger got tired after a while, so I stopped. But, but they've got, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of markers that are out there. And what we're dealing with with the false positive and false negative. So here's a size chromosome, and here's the linked marker that is close on the chromosome to a disease gene. And here's a damaged chromosome that does not have that marker and has a normal gene. And so when you read uh, these dogs together, um, and, uh, and then the resulting dog then produces egg or sperm, uh, the thing that creates diversity on this earth is that before you make egg or sperm, you mix up the chromosomes of, of your mother and your father, so that you're not inheriting entire chromosomes from one generation to the next. You have this meiotic crossover and exchanging of genetic material between paired chromosomes. And, uh, and if that crossover occurs between the marker and the gene, then you're going to all of a sudden have the disease gene there, but the dog's going to test normal or so a false negative result, or you'll have a normal gene there with a dog testing carrier and get a false positive result. And that's, that's what you deal with with, with marker-based tests. And, um, and it's a small percentage, but if you're, you have a dog that has false results, it's a big percentage to you. Um, so you know there are a lot less link marker-based tests out there. Fanconi was a link marker test until they found the, uh, oops, until they found the mutation, uh, Dr. Johnson and uh, lab found it, and, and so now you have a direct gene test. And, uh, and so you, you now have accurate results as long as the sample you're sending in is actually from the dog that you think that you're sampling, because uh, there's still are, well, there, there's still sampling mistakes that occur in the genetics labs and, and where people swear, you know, you know, no, I, I know my dogs, I know which dog I sampled, and then the lab comes back and says, you know, it says this is a male, but it's got two X chromosomes. You know, <laughs> and then the female that's two years older that you already tested that we still have its DNA is exactly the same dog that you sent in. So, you know, put colored collars on your dogs, please. Uh, yes. Um, so that's the story about like, marker-based tests. Okay, let's talk about genetic diseases in general. Uh, we have the Canine Health Foundation. Um, which is the uh, health arm of the AKC, and they fund um, uh, a lot of research, millions of dollars of research a year to, uh, um, to study genetic diseases and, and to identify defective genes and provide tests for us. And one way that they, that they know what to fund is that they query the breed clubs every year. What are the, the most important um, disorders that you're dealing with in your breeds and rank them in order? And so your breed club and your health committee or whoever gets asked and, and provides the answer to the AKC gets asked every single year that question. And they compile all of that data together and then, uh, and then the, the Care Health Foundation reports what are the diseases of concern for 2013, which is the last year that they did it. So they'll compile 2014 after the end of the year. Um, and that's how they determine what diseases get the most money for the research. So uh, before we look at those numbers, I want to ask you what disorders are you seeing in your dogs? And I will start the poll so it will throw it onto your web page. Or, um, okay, so if you're texting to the same address, you're putting the word disorders, space, and then writing in what disorders you're seeing, you can lump them together. Or if you've got the um, poleb.com, you're just going to fill in the box what disorders you are seeing in your dogs, not necessarily what you're testing for, and this is completely anonymous. It's, uh, here we go, and um, 
Yeah, I can't, I, I don't know who's answering what questions. It's completely anonymous. That's what makes this fun. You know, if I ask you, okay, raise your hands and tell me what disorders you see in your dogs, it makes for a very quiet seminar. <laughs> okay, uh, thyroid, male infertility, inflammatory bowel disease, liver disease, hypothyroidism, PRA lurking in the background, uh, cancer, and PRA lurking in the background, of course, if you're testing for PRA, you know, but what we do know is that the late onset PRA that we have a test for is not the only PRA in the breeding. We have a much earlier onset PRA that we don't have a test for, and that's what's lurking that we don't have any way of identifying. <clears throat> Bladder stones, pancreatic insufficiency, uh, cystic or white stones, um, thyroid cancer, cancer, two cancers. <laughs> Slip discs. I'm still texting a couple of people. Give it one more. Allergies. Interesting because I had a question I was going to ask you guys about allergies. Okay. All right. So, you know, again, the disorders we're seeing are not just the disorders that we're testing for. Um, so there are a lot of things that, that we have that we don't have tests for, but we certainly can diagnose them and select against them. And that's an important thing to consider. So top 10 canon health concerns based on 2013 results, and the numbers in parentheses were the 2012 results from the year prior. And 2014 is not going to come out until about February or so um, when, uh, when they collate the results from 2014. So hip dysplasia is number one, and this is across all breeds, okay? Epilepsy is number two and has been number two and remained in the top three forever. Allergies um, moves up and down. It was five, it's now three, but certainly we see allergies across most breeds. Hemangiosarcoma as the, as the first of the malignant inherited cancers that we deal with in dogs. Hypothyroidism was three, it went down to five. Lymphoma is the second of the malignant inherited cancers. Um, Bloat, gastric dilatation with bobulus went from nine up to seven. Um, that came up on the, on the list more recently. Teleluxation's always been there, about, about number eight or so. Uh, cruciate ligament rupture um, has been going up. Uh, it was 11, now number nine. And inflammatory bowel disease was 13, now 10. Certainly something that we have in, in your breed and infl infiltrative inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the next 10, uh, cataracts were seventh, dropped down to 11th. And there's lots of different cataracts. It's not just one cataract gene, just like there's not one PRA. Osteosarcoma as uh, our third of our malignant cancers, um, number 12 from 14. Atopic dermatitis or atopy as a specific form of allergies, um, number 13. Elbow dysplasia, immune mediated hemolytic anemia, cardiomyopathy jumped on the list, wasn't on the list the year before. PRA um, used to be way up at top, but because so many breeds that have high frequencies of PRA have genetic tests now and can prevent it, it's dropped down as a, as a disorder of concern, not as a disorder that, that they still test for. Mammary tumors, uh, retained testicles, and mitral valvular disease. So those are the top 20 diseases, and it, it's interesting. These are querying purebred um, breeds. But if you look at mixed breed dogs and the most frequent disorders that we see in terms of genetic disorders in mixed breed dogs, and this is something I like to talk all the time to veterinarians, it's the exact same list. Okay, these are, these are just the most common ancient disease liability genes in dogdom. Most of these genes preceded the separation of breeds, and it's not surprising we see just as much in mixed breed dogs as we see in our purebred dogs. Um, because we purposefully breed and select with purebred dogs, some breeds have a higher frequency, some breeds have lower frequencies, but pretty much they're all going to have some percentage of, of these disorders. Do you, do you happen to know the response rate from the survey that was sent out? Yeah, we know exactly what, what breeds and, and what, what they selected. So they take a look at like large yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and you're going to, you know, certainly bloat is a, is a big, you know, is a deep chested breed disease because we do have some short legged chondrodystrophic breeds that can bloat, um, but they still are a deep chested breed and, and 
and your osteosarcomas are going to be in your rapidly growing long-legged breeds and, and things like that. So, so there's certainly morphological, you know, slip discs are going to be in long body, short-legged leg, breeds, you know, more so, um, although it can be seen in your, in your breed uh, as well. Um, your little breeds that develop mitral valvular disease, so there's certainly morphological or body confirmation uh, um, things that are going to be uh, liability factors as well. And not that those are not inherited liability factors, because those are brief characteristics, but, uh, uh, but certainly they are uh, part of the um, process. Okay, so the Canine Defeatome Project, um, you know, part of filling that out was filling out a health survey. And, you know, and I'm told that there is much more specific data available in terms of the answers to your health survey questions, but it's not available online. So this is what was available online on the Phenome Project um, webpage. It, it's mainly listing things by, um, by uh, category of what types of disorders you see in your breed. So these are the, the answers that we have there based on 1,760 dogs and where the owners fill that a health survey. It says hernia, 26.4%. Did that differentiate which type of hernia? No, that's, no, that's, that was the question I was just going to ask you. What kind of hernia was that? Was that a umbilical? Was it, was it, do you see inguinal hernia? Rarely. So it's going to be umbilical hernia type, type issues. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and then eye disorder, 9.3. Now, I don't, we don't know whether that's blindness. We don't know whether that's cataract. We don't, you know, certainly we expect some of that to be blindness. Um, with PRA, but it could be cataract, and, and whether that's PPMs, okay, and whether you're considering an, an iris to iris PPM a health issue versus an iris to lens or 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 she or or sheet or something like that, which actually would be a health issue. So so we've got things to talk about there. Temperament disorder, um, dental disorder, and again, you know, we don't know what category we're talking about. Endocrine disorder, are we talking about? Um, thyroid, are we talking about diabetes, are we talking about uh, Cushing's or Addison's or whatever? Uh, hard to say. Skin disorder, cancer tumors, urinary disorder, um, orthopedic, reproductive, heart, GI, um, ear, neurovascular, liver, blood, limb, and respiratory. So it, it gives you a ranking, but it doesn't really give you concrete answers as to what types of disorders. And again, I'm told that there were specific you know, answers and maybe that could be analyze, but in actuality, you need a, a, a current breed health survey. And the OFA does those for free, and you, you know, and the breed club formula, you know, the OFA works with the breed club to, to, to formulate it so that it's asking the questions your club wants to know the answers to, and, uh, and but does it in a statistically sound way on an online survey that doesn't cost the club anything, and, uh, and even though Clubs have had health surveys up there for years, so the, the data starts to get fuzzy because if you go for 15 years on a health survey, you know, you're averaging out 15 years, but the OFA can, can provide to the club you know, any way you want it to be divided. So you know, if you say, okay, we've got 15 years worth of data um, from worldwide and from pets as well as breeding dogs, which is the beauty of an online health survey, it's not just your breeding dogs and the dogs that you're showing, um, you can say, break it down into five-year segments and tell us what are the trends and the differences from the first five, the middle five, and the later five. And then you can see what the trends are and where your breed is going and what, you're, what, is, what is up and coming as a disorder and what is something that you're controlling and is, is going down in frequency as well. So that's an important thing I think your breed needs to do. Uh, to, uh, to um, another survey that uh, Dr. Richard Dorn did, but now we're talking about the 1990s, so we're talking 20 years ago, um, but he did a great um, analysis of, of dis frequently diagnosed diseases in veterinary teaching hospitals based on the Veterinary Medical Database Program, which is a computerized database of vet school diagnoses. And so for your breed, and, and what it, it did was an odds ratio, so compared all breeds together, and said what things were seen at a greater frequency in certain breeds and what things were seen at a lower frequency. So the average is going to be 1.0. That's the average across all dogs. And so PPMs, you had 110 times greater frequency of PPMs than all other dogs. And 
that's not a surprise. You all know that, so that that is an issue with your breed. Um, congenital anomaly other um, was high, but we have absolutely no idea what that is unless we know what the original data is. Kidney or Franconi syndrome, certainly we know that you have that much greater than other breeds. Um, Demodectic mange, you had a two times greater frequency than all other breeds. All short-coated breeds um, have a higher frequency of demodectic mange. So it goes with having a short coat. Um, and, uh, and certainly there are going to be some inherited factors that go along with it, but that's, that's your major morphological characteristic that is going to make a breed prone. And this is where I was going to ask about allergies, because allergic dermatitis, you have a 0.18 odds ratio of developing um, allergic dermatitis, which means that you have one-fifth the risk of getting a diagnosis of, of allergic dermatitis than other breeds. Now, we are talking about that are teaching hospital records here. So it's, a, it's what we call a tertiary facility. So it's, and most allergic dermatitis is not dealt with in referral to a tertiary facility, meaning it got, you know, your vet saw it, referred it to the specialists down the street or in the city, who then referred it to the vet school because it was so bizarre. You know, that's what, that's what happens at vet schools. You see some real oddball stuff, but they're not diagnosing atopy and allergic dermatitis as much as, as you know, what's being controlled easily in the primary care facility. So, um, but it is saying that you have a much lower risk. So that was my question to you. Are you seeing a lot less allergies than you see in your other breeds if you have multiple breeds? Or, or in general, do you think that it is less of a problem in your breed? Um, what? Okay, well that, that's a vaccine reaction. So that's just an overreaction of your immune system. Right. Okay, so, so that, which is, you know, more of a, of a, it's not really an autoimmune, but it's, it's, it's a sensitive immune system type of problem, completely different from, from allergies. Um, and an allergic dermatitis doesn't separate what we know of as atopy, which is an inhalant, you know, inhaling uh, mold or, or pollens or dust or dust mites and those types of things uh, versus versus contact allergy versus food allergy, which occurs much, much less frequency, frequently than people think. You know, everyone thinks that you've got allergies and if you change your food, it's going to, you know, it's going to make it better because they're allergic to the food. There are some foods that actually have omega fatty acids and have things in them that are going to actually help dampen down the allergic reactivity, but it's not because they were allergic to the other food. Um, it's because you are eating and, and what is put into those foods can help um, uh, modulate allergic reactivity. But just saying allergic dermatitis doesn't tell us a whole lot. But anyway, it was interesting that it was so low on your read there. Lack of green products? <laughs> Adherence to bath? <laughs> Okay, so let's look at specific disorders where we have um, some information for you. Um, the, uh, the OFA runs the eye certification registry now that has replaced SURF. Um, I won't get into a whole drawn out thing about it, but uh, um, you know, because now SURF is gone and actually it, it, it's, it was a cordial thing that happened and, and you're gonna see a press release come out this fall um, of a joint thing between SERP and the OFA and where they're working together with each other, where OFA is actually, SERP was a way for the Veterinary Medical Database program to fund itself, okay? They never really were interested in doing eye exams, but it was a way for them to raise money to do this Veterinary Medical Data program that records diseases in all the vet, vet schools and everything like that. But SERP was, was contracted by the ophthalmologist to collect information um, the ophthalmologist over time said, we want this done a little differently, we need more information than what you're providing, and SERP pretty much said, man, we're making a lot of money, and we don't want to do more work, and we're very happy with what we're providing for you, and that's all we're going to do. And so the ophthalmologist went to the OFA and said, we want, you know, we don't want to just know about how much cataracts, we want to know the age of onset of cataracts, we want to track it by age, we want to, we want to be able to track diagnoses, um, you know, not just in SERP clinics, but every diagnosis that, that we make in our hospital, an ophthalmologist sees appointments all day long, we want to track those diagnoses as well and really get a full picture of what's going on. We put a lot more information in OFA said, yeah, we can do that. And so the ophthalmologist said, okay, we're going to use OFA. And that's, that's the flip-flop that happened there. 
There was nothing that the OFA said, we're going to, you know, we're going to monopolize and chomp on surf and, and get rid of them. It was surf not responding to a business partner that wanted something different. And OFA said, if you want us, we can do it. And that's, that's how it occurred. But, uh, um, but it is a cordial relationship between the two of them, you know, as much that as people want to say, it wasn't. It, uh, Surf was trying to keep themselves above board, but finally said, you know, it's not worth it. We're, you know, it's not what we really want to do. We want money for our program, and OFA is donating money to them for their program so that they can still do the things that they want to do. At any rate, the latest um, eye registration figures here. Um, the most frequent diagnosis in uh, Vicente's are PPMs, iris to iris, 54%. Um, this is from eye exams between 2010 and 2012, and there were 929 um, uh, OFA exams on Vicente's, and 503 of them had iris to iris PPM. So we know iris to iris does not cause blindness or disease, and so we don't really select against that um, at this point. 46.1% um, were normal. 8.8 had endothelial opacity with persistent pupillary membranes, which certainly affects vision. Um, 6.4 had iris to cornea PPMs, which also can cause um, opacity and uh, affect vision. 4.5% um, had cataract significance unknown, and that's something that OFA wants to work with the ophthalmologists about because there's a much better way to categorize cataracts and just say there's a cataract significance unknown. Um, there's, there's so many different ways to categorize them so where we know what the significance is of those. Um, PPMs, iris to lens, 3.4. Corneal dystrophy, 3.3. A punctate cataract with posterior sutures. Now that's something, a type of cataract that has been categorized by an ophthalmologist. We know exactly what it means. We know exactly that it's inherited and, uh, and what the significance is of it. 1.4% and generalized PRA 1.4%. So those are the latest numbers. Um, the ACBO, the ophthalmologists, do not recommend reading any vicinity with corneal dystrophy, a cataract, coloboma, PRA, or PPMs other than iris to iris. So those are the recommendations that you should be selecting against those dogs. Does it absolutely mean that that a you know a top quality dog with something like that should should never be bred? I never say never, but certainly it has, it has to have major major reasons for breeding to, to to go against that major strike of being phenotypically affected with a disease that requires probably more than one pair of genes being involved with it. Uh, PRA in the Vicente, autosomal recessive mutation causing late onset blindness. So this is the PRA that has been identified where you have a direct genetic test. That test was developed in 2013, so it's relatively new for you. Um, there is evidence of retinal degeneration anywhere from 5 to 11 years of age, but that's for, based on an ophthalmologist looking, looking at a dilated eye through a scope. So you need a, a dilated eye exam to make that determination. Um, it's not something, you, and, and that does not cause blindness. That is not going to cause um, night, you know, um, decreased vision at, at nighttime. We're talking about the physical representation of the cornea. We're not talking about the function of the cornea. So um, clinical signs of blindness in affected dogs may not occur until late in life, um, or possibly not at all. And we see with a lot of the late onset PRAs that you know, if your dog lived to to 30, it would definitely go blind, okay? But, but a lot of these dogs, they don't live long enough for that degeneration to be complete enough, so they can have visual problems. They will be homozygous um, uh, affected on the DNA exam, but they will not necessarily be come blind. Um, but many of them do, so it's certainly something we do want to select against, but, uh, uh, but it's not a guarantee that all of them do become blind. There is another PRA that exists in the breed with an earlier age of onset, and, and so and there are other earlier onset PRAs where all homozygous um, affectants do go blind once they do have a, a genetic test. And that's the nature of the beast. You get an earlier onset, then the range of onset is going to be a lot earlier, even if you're an outlier, so maybe you don't go blind until you're eight years of age, 
but it's, you know, but you're still going to get there. Whereas the late onset ones, the tail end of that is beyond the life expectancy of a lot of dogs, and it's just, it's just the way that it happens. So, uh, no test is available. There's certainly research going on, um, including in Dr. Johnson's lab, to try to identify um, the, what's causing that early onset blindness. But right now, all you can do is identify, identify it. Test for the other PRA to know it's not that PRA. Okay, important thing to distinguish. And then know that you're dealing with the other PRA if there isn't more than one other PRA, which again, we never know about those things. But we certainly know there is another one that occurs with enough frequency that that is something that your breed is dealing with. Okay, um, 460 dogs have been tested by LFA since 2013. 73.7 are homozygous normal. That's a really good number. Okay, 23.3% are carrier, 107 dogs, and 14 dogs, 3% uh, tested as effective. And that's not that different than the 1.9% that were reported as effective based on the, on the OFAI exam. So 1.9% versus 3%. So looks like you're screening your population, you're getting about the same numbers of what your effectives are. And certainly it's, some, it's a disease that we can prevent effectives that we have a direct genetic test that is 100% accurate, that we can read our quality carriers and not eliminate them, and, and slowly replace our quality carriers with quality normal testing offspring. Okay, hypothyroidism in the Vicente. It's a diagnosis of autoimmune thyroiditis, not just a thyroid responsive condition, and dogs with measurable antibodies are affected. 8.10% of Ascendis tested by Michigan State University, which is the largest thyroid testing um, lab in the United States, are positive for thyroid autoantibodies based on 740 Ascendi samples that were submitted. The average for all breeds is 7.5%, um, so you've got a little bit more than the average breed. Um, OFA thyroid results show 6.2% to 420 Ascendis but that's a skewed sample because you're voluntarily submitting those results to the OFA. The Michigan State results, you don't know whether your dog is going to test hypothyroid before you send it in. So it's a, it's a prospective, um, it's a, a prospective, it's whatever it is. It's, you're testing before you know, so you're not, you're not going to have um, uh, people not sending in results to Michigan State because they already know it's hypothyroid versus the OFA thyroid registry. So canine hypothyroidism is a, um, it's an autoimmune thyroiditis. It's, it's antibodies attacking the thyroid gland. And what we have to recognize is that the thyroid profile is a snapshot of a continuous, you know, I call it a snapshot of a movie. All right, so you're only seeing one frame when you do a profile. But the, but the disease process is a movie. It's a process that goes on over time. Um, the average range of when those autoantibodies are being produced is anywhere from two to six years of age on average, with a peak at four years of age. That's when the, the, the thyroglobulin autoantibody is present in that blood sample. Um, after thyroid gland destruction, so you, you have normal T4s, you have normal thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH, and you have you know, very low measurable autoantibody, uh, thyroid autoantibody levels. You start developing the autoantibodies, so that goes up. But there's enough thyroid tissue that's normal, it's producing T4s, that the T4 stays the same, and the TSH from the pituitary that's telling the thyroid to produce more, more hormone is going to be the same as well, because you've got normal T4s. But that autoantibody level starts going up. Once enough thyroid tissue has been destroyed so that it can't produce enough T4, that T4 starts to drop, the pituitary says, hey, there's not enough T4. It produces more TSH. That starts to go up. And as the, the thyroid gland becomes destroyed, the antigen, or the thing that's stimulating the antibodies, is the normal thyroid tissue. So as the thyroid gland gets destroyed, once it's, it's destroyed, the cause of the antibody is no longer there. Those antibody levels are going to drop. Okay, your T4s are going to be low because they can't produce T4. Your TSHs are going to be high. That's end stage hypothyroidism. So when that autoantibody level rises and then disappears is going to differ between dogs, but usually between that two to six year range. Um, I recommend two thyroid hormone, uh, two thyroid profiles, including thyroid autoantibody, TSH, and T4. 
by, by equilibrium dialysis, which is what's required for the OFA thyroid profile, and, um, and do that two years apart, anytime between two and six years of age. And if both of those are normal, it's likely that the dog is, is not affected with hypothyroidism. It's got nothing to do with carrying liability genes for hypothyroidism. Okay? Um, the one thing you have to recognize is that any vaccines are going to increase all antibodies in the system. Vaccines are a tremendous immune stimulator, and every, every type of antibodies can go up after a vaccine. So you shouldn't run a thyroid profile for autoantibodies within several months of getting a vaccine. If you're going in and you need a vaccine during that visit, you can still draw the blood for the thyroid profile and send it in and get your vaccine, but you don't want to get a thyroid profile run, I say on the safe side, three to six months. You know, some people say one or two months. You know, I'm, I like being really safe. So three to six, within three to six months of getting a vaccine, you do not do a thyroid profile because you can get falsely elevated results. If you get elevated results and you're thinking that they're abnormal, wait three to four months, run it again. Okay, if you've got hypothyroidism, it's still going to be up there. If it was due to a vaccine or immune stimulation, it's going to be down again. And that's not what happens with hypothyroidism. It doesn't go. The antibody levels don't go like that. Thyroid levels can go like that, but not the antibody levels. Okay, Fanconi syndrome. You can probably tell me more about Fanconi syndrome than I can tell you. Um, but it's an autosomal recessive defect in kidney tubule transport. It causes glucose or sugar in the urine. Um, low urine concentration, metabolic acidosis, increased blood chlorine, and reduced kidney filtering, onset 3 to 11 years of age. Uh, clinical diagnosis of finding glucose in the urine with normal blood glucose, and that's what you were running for Franconi as your test forever until so you had your first linkage and now direct DNA test. Treat with diet and medications. The Conjo protocol is a great protocol. Uh, I've used that with metabolic, with Fanconi. I, I've had a, a, some random red cats with Fanconi that I use the Conjo protocol in. And they're using those big, those big pills in the banana how they're getting them into the cats. Five a day, but that's doing great. But uh, at any rate, um, so you have a genetic test available from the OFA. Worldwide genetic testing for the mutation now. Um, uh, normal 57.84%, carrier 37.98, and effective 4.19%, okay? USA testing um, for the mutation. Uh, I don't know where my end parenthesis is on the normals, but at any rate, 54.84% uh, normal, 37.15% carrier, 5.10% for effective. A little different than the worldwide testing, and if you look, at, and, and there is a list of all the, of all the different countries uh, where dogs are coming from with their test results being run at the OFA or, or being run um, elsewhere. And, uh, and some countries have higher, some countries have lower. It's, again, the nature of the beast, who's being selected for breeding, who's not, and who's passing it on. But you have a genetic test. These are certainly a third of the breed being carriers is not a good thing. But having a genetic test and using it in a, in a wise manner that does not negatively impact the genetic diversity and quality of your breed is a smart thing to do and you will be able to, to slowly diminish these numbers and make an impact and make uh, your mercedes be healthier in regard to this disease. Okay, canine hip dysplasia um, does occur in little dogs as well as big dogs and we certainly know that even though people think it's just a big dog disease. Um, in little dogs you have late, less weight stress causing as much pain as the big dogs, but you certainly have the disease, and we certainly have a lot of painful um, little dogs with hip dysplasia as well. Uh, hip statistics, um, you rank 157th out of 261 breeds. Um, this is where you don't want to be number one, okay? Uh, based on 2,651 Vicenji radiographs, 96.3% of Vicenji's radiographed and evaluated by OFA are normal, 3.5% are dysplastic, the average for all breeds for dysplasia is 11.4%. So you're, you're doing great with hip dysplasia. It's not a biggie with your breed, but it certainly could be a biggie if you don't pay attention to it. Um, excellence, you've got 23% with excellent phenotype um, compared to 15.7 average for all breeds. And again, the phenotype is a bell curve. 
which no one in my family had anything to do with, but that's what they call it. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you, you've got your excellence up here, you've got your, you know, you've got your goods, you've got your fares, you've got your borderlines, you've got your dysplastics, and so it's no surprise if you have a low frequency of dysplasia, you're going to have a lot more excellent confirmation and morphology um, that goes along with it. So, um, so you're doing very good as a breed there. Your trends are excellent. Um, in terms of uh, where you're going, although you were doing better in the late 90s and, and dysplastics have crept up a little bit um, in the more recent years. So maybe you're thinking that things are much better than they are and, and you're slacking off on getting hip radiographs done, but you should, it's a once a lifetime test, it's a single x-ray, um, you still should do it on any breeding dog and uh, ensure that you are breeding um, dogs that are not liable for dysplasia. We'll talk about that when I conclude um, in terms of how to control a, a, uh, a complex or polygenically inherited trait. Elbow dysplasia in the Basenji, you rank 67th with 375 dogs, 96.8% normal, um, and 3.2% dysplastic, uh, which means 12 dogs that were graded with grade one elbow dysplasia. The only dogs that are painful and have clinical um, lameness and pain with elbow dysplasia have grade twos and grade threes. So it's that type of disease. So in actuality, no Basenjis, based on who's been evaluated by the OFA, has clinical elbow dysplasia where they're going to have liability and pain and need medication and so forth. But the problem with elbow dysplasia is that, um, is that when you see a dog that has grade two or grade three, and then you screen their close relatives, you see a lot of grade one. So grade one is a sentinel that's telling you that you're accumulating elbow dysplasia liability genes and that you need to pay attention to those grade ones or you're gonna start ending up with grade twos and grade threes. So again, not, you know, very low on the list. So uh, in terms of percentages, so you, you've got a great situation there um, and probably not something that uh, you need to be getting crazy about but if you're taking your dog in for hip x-ray and, and they go ahead and they shoot the elbows at the same time and submit it for five bucks more to the OFA to get both the hips and the elbows evaluated, at least you know what you've got in your breeding dogs, not every dog, but in your breeding dogs, and, and you can keep it better under control. Patella luxation, I, I figured would be a much bigger issue with your breed being a shorter statured breed in that regard. And before I finish, I want to tell you something that makes me look really stupid, but I'm happy to share it with you. But uh, at any rate, um, so Patel Luxation, you rank 91 out of 110, um, 328 dogs examined, 99.1% uh, normal, and 0.9% abnormal, which is, I think, one dog. So um, <laughs> now again, Patella is not like hips and elbows where, um, where you're sending it in before you know the answer. Your vet is evaluating patellas, writing it out on a sheet, and then you're sending it in. Okay, so if you've got abnormals and you don't send it in, it's not being reported, and you can and you can skew results like that. But but still, I think it looks like you're doing pretty good, and it probably comes from the the historical nature of your breed. You know, your nature, your breed was a working breed, and 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 for small stature breeds where patelluxation is a big problem, you know, if your dogs were were coming up lame and couldn't hunt out in the bush, you know, they're not gonna be bred, they're, they're not gonna be used, they're not gonna be bred, and so you have a, a big selection differential there. And, and we see that with a lot of sporting breeds where, where um, disorders that should be at a higher frequency are not because the breeders that came before us were so, you know, so efficient at not allowing unsound dogs to be bred and, uh, and work in that direction. Prior weight kinase deficiency, um, autosome recessive, it causes hemolytic anemia. Uh, so it, it causes, it's a disease where with activity, they build up this lactic acid in their system and, 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 it, and it, it causes their, their blood cells to, to burst and they get this hemolytic anemia. Um, the Basenji actually was, I think, the first breed ever reported with prior weight kinase deficiency. Um, and uh, so it became a poster child for it because it is a human disease as well. Um, and an enzyme assay uh, was developed in the 1970s, and your breeders um, used that assay to identify carriers. Go ahead. So, um, 
So the, a genetic test was developed in 1994, and as reported by OFA, 330 percentages have been tested uh, with one drug testing this carrier in 2005. And I spoke to Dr. Urs Giger at University of Pennsylvania, who, um, who was big on, on this and, and was actually very active in, in, in researching it, and still very active in many other groups that have high frequency, higher frequency of PK. Um, and he said as well, we don't see any effective percentages. Every once in a while, we'll see a carrier. So it, it's still out there, but it's not something I would be screening for unless you know of close relatives that are carrier or or have gotten about um, in that regard, because the frequency is going to be so low um, for this disease. And the last disease I want to talk about before we do our last half hour on control is immunoproliferative small intestinal disease, which is your inflammatory bowel disease. And it's not it's not just the, um, it's much more than just inflammatory bowel disease in your breed. We have a lot of breeds that have inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease. Your breed's disease is much more specific in terms of it being immunoproliferative, in terms of it causing the specific type of pathology and thickening in the intestine. So, so you are further along in knowing what type of inflammatory bowel disease your breed has. And, um, and so, uh, and it causes progressive chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, maldigestion, emaciation, they lose weight. Some, some dogs are so badly affected that they die. Um, they just get so emaciated that they die of literally of starvation because no matter what they eat, they can't absorb it. Um, it's caused by inflammatory thickening of the small intestines, onset less than two years of age to middle age, so a wide range of onset, as well as a wide range of severity. Uh, treatment immunosuppressive drugs and diet. Um, the diagnosis is with intestinal biopsy. I don't know that anyone is has a a funded grant study to study your breed specifically for this. I don't know how much Dr. Johnson is looking at this with the DNA that he has, um, but it's certainly a disease that um, occurs enough to know that it's a breed-related disease. And that, um, and that without any test for carriers, um, genetic research should be able to tell you to find liability genes for you and help you out in this way. So um, you don't know what your numbers are. I know that in the Phenome Project, I saw a survey where he was querying about it, but it really wasn't the type of survey that's going to give you prevalence numbers. Um, you need a, a regular breed health survey. Um, that gives you prevalence numbers so you know, you know, how much chronic diarrhea and, and uh, weight loss, you know, type of syndrome issues and how many dogs have been diagnosed by biopsy because certainly it's not, this isn't just a cheek swab or a blood test. You're, you're talking about going in pathologically and taking a piece of the test and sending it to pathologists uh, for a biopsy. And I'm not sure whether um, you can do that just through a, through a, um, a a proctological endoscopy type of, of procedure, or whether you actually have to go midline incision, go in and cut out a piece of a full thickness piece of intestine to make that diagnosis. I don't know the specifics of your disease as much. Yes. Well, we used to see quite a lot of it, and I wonder whether it's still there. Yeah. Well, it's still yeah. I. I, I really don't think that it's caused by ethoxyquin. Um, it, it is a genetic disease, um, and I think that certainly there's a lot of different things that can be in foods that, you know, the food that goes through your intestinal tract affects things. And, and, you know, and what's in your food and what's in the food that you feed your dogs uh, can have all sorts of different effects. So, so you know, I'm not coupon. You know, the fact that there's lots of stuff in food and we don't know what's, you know, sometimes what's good and what's bad for them. But I don't think that this is purely based on a doxyquin or it would have been occurring in all breeds and not just the receptive. So, so could that have had an effect? You know, possibly, but, I, but we're still seeing it and I think that, I think that it's much more than that. <coughs> so that's a disease that I think that, uh, you know, we need to have somebody, you know, somebody that, that wants to get involved and, and look at that as a disease process. 
Okay, so that's the diseases and disorders in your breed that I come up with that I, we can talk about there. And so I want to finish up here with a couple of things. But, but first, I, I want to, this is the ethics part of the talk um, about what are our responsibilities as breeders. So who is a reputable breeder? And it's one that does genetic testing. Um, this is a little bumper sticker, or you can put it on your tack box or, or whatever from the OFA, health test the parents for healthier puppies. When you do your OFA testing, a lot of times you'll get, you'll get one of those stickers uh, uh, with the result. And, and we'd like you to put those you know, prominently in places that people see them because getting the word out that health testing is important to the general public is so tough. So, so tough to get people to understand that there's a difference between you know, buying from, from a breeder and buying from a breeder that actually does health testing and is trying to improve the health of the breed. Um, responsibility, the, the, tech, the, the dictionary definition is duty, obligation, or burden. What is the obligation of a breeder to do genetic testing? Breeders are the custodians of their breeds and their gene pool. Above all, do no harm is, a, is part of the Hippocratic oath that, that we take as physicians and as veterinarians, but it's something that as breeders you have to, you have to think of as well. Um, breeders have to use genetic tests for the best interests of their breed. What is the expectation of the general public? You go Google image on general public, or at least when I did it a couple of years ago, I have no idea why this picture came up. <laughs> but the expectation of the general public is that the quality control for genetic disease is already being done. The public thinks that every breeder is selecting for health, is doing health testing, and, and it's just not happening. You know, I'm, I'm not, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but in general, in dog breeding, it is just not happening. It is the ethical responsibility and obligation of all breeders to perform the available required pre-breeding genetic health tests on prospective breeding stock prior to any breeding. All genetic disease cannot be prevented. However, we have the knowledge and the tools to improve the genetic health of puppies. Many health tests can be performed during examination with your veterinarian or obtained inexpensively at local health screening clinics. And on the OFA website, there are a lot of screening clinics that are listed, so under the clinic tab on the OFA website, but actually there's a much better um, place to look for health screening clinics, and that's the CavierHealth.org website. They have done a phenomenal job. They list every single health clinic in North America, Canada, United States, and Mexico for Whatever tests you want done, eyes, heart, hips, whatever, they have it on their website. It's an amazing resource if you're looking to see, you know, I've got dogs that are two years of age that need to be tested. You know, what, you know, you can look up by your state, by your city, by whatever, and see what clinics are coming up where, what the prices are, who's doing the exams, if you're particular about who does the exams, and so forth. So let's talk about managing genetic disease. That's not a disease, that's just <laughs> So with dominant genes, what you need to do is you need to replace affected breeding dogs with normal siblings, a parent, or prior born offspring, so with normals. So, so with our number one goal of not producing affected, so if you have an affected dog with a dominant disorder, you know 50% of their offspring are gonna get that gene and they're gonna be affected itself. So, um, and you don't want to breed and produce more affected dogs. So, so you want to replace the affected dog with a relative so you can maintain your breeding program and your line. So not necessarily the dog that you wanted to breed, but a normal relative. And that normal relative could be, if it's a late onset disorder and a dog was already bred that has some normal offspring, or if one of the parents was normal, if there's semen that's still present from the sire that can be used, or, or if, you know, if you've got, a, you know, evictions that can be leased or, or that are owned by breeder friends of yours and you want to, you know, you want to um, uh, get out of them. So you need to select a normal individual to breed for dominance. With recessive genes, if you have a test for carriers, like you have for PRA, like you have for Frank Pony, or even PK, um, you want to breed your quality carriers to genetically normal mates. Um, replace the carrier parent with a genetically normal offspring and select against placing a lot of new carriers in breeding homes because we want to decrease the frequency of that defective gene. So the proper use of genetic tests, without genetic tests, the effective selection of the gene pool is minimal. But with genetic tests, if everyone decides not to breed carriers, it can have a significant limiting effect on the gene pool. So you've got 500 percentages being registered by AKC a year. 
okay? A little over a third of those guys are carriers of Fanconi. All right, 25% of those are carriers of PRA, of a late onset PRA as well. Um, and they don't coincide with each other, but if you don't breed those carriers, how many percentages do you have left to breed? And how many percentages are you gonna have registered next year? Okay, you can't eliminate your breed in a blind attempt to eliminate diseases, especially when you can absolutely prevent ever having produced any more dogs with Fanconi or PRA or PK um, by breeding your quality carriers to a normal. Um, if a breeder, and I understand the emotional response when you get back that carrier test result. You know, you, you, this is a dog you already decided is your next breeding dog because you're, you're, you're doing your pre-breeding testing, okay? And you get back that result that says carrier, and emotionally, that dog is less in your eyes in that split second. That dog is emotionally less in your eyes because it's a carrier. And, and emotionally, you're gonna say, I can't breed this dog anymore. This, this can't be my next breeding dog because of that carrier test result. And it's absolutely the worst possible decision that you can make. It is completely insane to make that decision. Okay? <laughs> Because it's, it, it's one gene out of hundreds of thousands of genes that are in your dog. And it's one gene that you can absolutely control in one generation. And so if it's a quality dog that you had already decided that this dog is a quality that I'm going to, to want to breed it, that single test cannot change that decision. Um, an individual is not an eye, a hip, a heart, a kidney. Each individual carries tens of thousands of genes. Each is part of the breed's gene pool. You must consider all aspects of health, confirmation, temperament, working ability, and making breeding decisions based on a single testable gene. Now we're talking testable now, so that we can predict is inappropriate. For recessive diseases, this is a quote from Dr. Paula Henthorne at the University of Pennsylvania, um, who runs a genetics lab there. Great, great um, doctor, and, uh, and I love this quote, and I always attribute it to her um, because it's great. For recessive diseases, a direct genetic test should not alter who gets bred, only who they get bred to. So you breed a carrier to a normal, and you replace that carrier with a, with a normal test in offspring. <laughs> genetic registries. So we have the, the Karen Phenome Project, um, and we have Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Johnson's uh, um, DNA repository that he has for you. Over 4,000 Basenji DNA samples stored in the repository. Amazing, amazing number of, 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 that could be the largest DNA repository of any breed, or, or if, if not, it's gotta be top five. Well, and that's because our community is so. Absolutely. Yeah, to work. Absolutely. So this is, this is a great, great resource for your breed. And I know Dr. Johnson, I know that, you know, if someone at some other university says, you know, I'm, you know, I've got a grant to study uh, immunoproliferative, uh, um, you know, disease, uh, small bowel disease, and, and I need samples for that, he would work with them. I, I mean, he's, you know, I know that he's that kind of guy, because I already know he's, he's shared samples with NC State for, you know, yeah, you know, I know lots of, of projects where he has shared DNA, where he has it, and, and others need it, and he said, I, you know, I'm willing to share that with you. So, the OFA, um, I want to show you a little bit about the OFA so that uh, there are things that you, um, that you know about. So I want to go to the website here. OFA is a, is a huge resource for you. Um, it's got, uh, you know, you can look up dogs um, uh, based on their parts of their name or, or the registration number. Um, you can look at health uh, you can look at health surveys. Um, you can look at statistics um, that you have um, for your breeds, so that you know where your breed stands for different types of disorders. Uh, um, you've got your database statistics for each disease, or you can just go ahead and, and look at your breed itself. And it'll show you that, uh, you know, for the different diseases, you know, what the percentages are um, based on the evaluations. And recognizing that the cardiac evaluations 
you're sending in after the exam, so you're, it's going to be a lot of normals. You're not going to see a lot of effectives there um, unless you have a, a club uh, um, uh, persona that says we must send everything in that, that is giving you more accurate results there. The same thing with Patel is as well. Um, but your, your other tests that you're sending in, like PRA and your and, uh, uh, Fanconi and your and, um, your hips and your, uh, and your elbows are going to be skewed towards normal as well because obviously affected dogs, a lot of people are not going to send those into OFA. Um, but, but still, I think that it, doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that your, your breed is, is really good with those statistics. And, and uh, um, so I think that that's something you need to continue to work with in that way. Um, so there's lots of things on the OFA website that, that you can uh, use, and I'm going to show you a couple of more things, but I want to move on here. Okay, the Canine Health Information Center um, is the CHIC, uh, CHIC Center. And so this is the Standard of Care and Health Conscious Breeding, and that was that is established and run by the OFA. Um, you know, initially we did some work with the Canine Health Foundation to set it up, but it is, but it is an OFA um, program. And you can look up your chick breeds here, and you look at your Asenji, and it shows you what your um, required tests are. So these are breed requirements before you breed a Asenji as determined by your breed club. So you're the ones that have made the determination. A hip x-ray, thyroid evaluation, eye exam, Fanconi syndrome tests, and what has just been added this past year is the uh, PRA test, the DNA test. So those are the requirements for any dog being used for breeding uh, to get a chick certification um, to show that they are um, uh, being tested for the common testable diseases in the breed. Chick is an open health database. It uh, has been determined by the National Breed Club. And the beauty of chick is that dogs receive chick certification based on completing the required genetic testing regardless of normal or abnormal outcomes. So as more testable disorders emerge, every individual is likely to carry some deleterious gene. You're going to have your carrier test, but you still get your chick certification. So it's not about health normalcy, it's about health consciousness. And that's, that's what chick is trying to do, is make people more health conscious about breeding so you can make breeding decisions that include carriers, that include dogs whose hips aren't perfect, but you know how to breed to make their offspring's hips better in that regard. Um, so it just showed you that 191 Vicentis have achieved chick certification. So it's not a lot of your dogs, but uh, certainly, um, certainly we like to see those numbers continue to go up. And I picked out one dog here, so there's a lucky dog that I picked out. It's, uh, it's page here. So this is Kinetic Tanza Soul Music. Does anyone know this dog? Yes. So I picked one out that some people know, actually. Um, born in 2006. So we can see here that the patellas were normal at a year of age, thyroid was normal at a year of age, and if you move down the list, thyroid was again normal at, uh, um, at five years of age. Uh, hips were normal, or were excellent. Elbows were normal, and it had a surf eye exam in about 2007, 2010, and 2011, which is probably pretty much when the breeding career of that dog was at that time and had a Fanconi syndrome test done in 2011, which was clear and normal. Doesn't have the PRA test, but, uh, um, but it doesn't look like it was doing testing during, uh, you know, in this past year, when you look at all the averages there. About here just now. Oops. Okay, so what this tells us, so, so first of all, it tells us about this individual dog. Um, another thing I want to point out is you got a picture of the dog there. So by donating through the OFA website $10, you can upload the picture of your dog, and that $10 goes to your Canine Health Foundation Donor Advice Fund for the Vicente Club. So that's money that doesn't just get spent willy-nilly, it, it's determined by your club how that money is being spent. Okay, but you get your dog's picture here. This is your dog's web page. This is Facebook for dogs. Okay? <laughs> this is exactly what it's telling you, because now I have results on, on your dog, and then I have the sire and the dam's results. I see the sire has a little chick next to his name, so the sire has, has done the, all the chick testing, and it has the results for hips, elbow, cardiac, eyes, Fanconi, uh, or for the sire, hips, eyes, Fanconi, patella, and thyroid. 
The dam has results for hips, elbows, cardiac, eyes, cranconi, patella, and PRA. I've got one offspring with results. I've got full siblings of the dog with some results. I've got half siblings to the sire and half siblings to the dam with results. This is giving me the depth and breadth of pedigree information for these most of these being complexly inherited disease where you need that information to tell you the chance of carrying liability genes for those diseases. If we go to a vertical pedigree on this dog, this is a vertical hip pedigree. He has excellent hips, has one sib with good hips. His sire had good hips, had a sib with excellent hips. His dam had excellent hips with a sib with one with excellent hips. Paternal grandsire good with two sibs, excellent and good. Paternal grand dam um, was not, did not have hips done, but one sibling was good. Excellent um, maternal grandsire, a fair maternal grand dam with two goods and one fair. So the genes in that line there look like they're not as good as other parts of the line there. But it's giving you more depth and breadth of pedigree information in that regard. And I want to show you, just as an example, this is a, this is a uh, um, vertical pedigree of a, of a golden retriever that we used in the, in the OFA um, article that we wrote. And this dog had excellent hips, and this is a prolific uh, stud dog. Had 126 offspring um, OFA, sort of, uh, OFA evaluated. His sire was fair, had three sibs, one good and two fair. His dam was good, had 13 sibs, eight good and five fair. His grandparents fair with good and fair sibs, fair, good with good and fair sibs, and fair um, with good and fair sibs. So in the background of this dog, it doesn't look like excellent, all right? Look at what he produced in his mating. In multiple matings to multiple different females, what has he produced? There's a lot of other stuff in there, but goods, 70. Excellence, 10. Fairs, 37. He's producing primarily goods, but more fairs than excellent. Even though he's phenotypically excellent, you think he's gonna pass on as excellent. He's passing on what his pedigree is telling you he should be passing on. That's what depth and breadth of pedigree tells you about a dog. And you can do thyroid, you can do eyes, you can do you know, many different systems, patellas, cardiac, on the OFA website, and get a vertical pedigree on your dogs. But the thing is, getting all these good numbers and results does no one any good if you're not releasing the abnormal results. So you need to initial that authorization for release of abnormal results. And I'm one of the guys sitting on the OFA board, every single board meeting saying, when are we going to make this sit the check off for I want to hide the results? You know, we're never going to say you can't, you can't make the decision. But if we're an animal health organization that's promoting health, then why do we make it easy to not report abnormal results? We should make it easier to report and make the people that don't want to report have to do something extra. And, I, and, and what I'm being told is, we do track open health reporting, how, what percentage of each breed does initial for open health reporting. So you were up over 50% in 2008, you dropped down about 40%, you went up over 50% in 2010, and the last three years you've been dropping on your open reporting on signing. I forget to sign it. And maybe you forget to sign it, but some people maybe you just won't sign it because they don't know what the results are gonna be. Hard to say. In your breed with hips, because this is hips that they're reporting, uh, you know, you know, it's not a gamble for you to sign for open health reporting because most of you are going to have really good hips anyway. But, but the bottom line is, is that OFA, my colleagues on the board are saying, when more, when more than 50% are signing for open reporting, that's when we'll move it. Well, I'll keep pushing it at every meeting. But, but this is something we need to be pushing, the open reporting of abnormal health results. Yes? Now, I've moved and I've changed that in a completely different state. And I had to point it out to yeah. Yeah. And I so tell the best that they need. that is covered, like when you in seminars, conferences, and that's right. stress to inform the owners. Yes, and I do inform the veterinarians and try to point them in that direction as well. As long as we keep problems secret, we'll not be able to deal with them. Breeders need to be informed about the problems occurring in the offspring that they produce. 
The days of stigmatizing health te testing breeders who have produced dogs affected or carrying hereditary disease is over. And what I say is now the stigma lies with those that hide it. So for those that hide it and that don't sign it, and then have <clears throat> all their affected dogs that they're not reporting, and then all of a sudden, you know, a dog that they sold or a dog that, that they, you know, that uh, someone bred to or whatever, and then they're producing disease, and then they kind of say, oh, well, yeah, we, we have seen some of that, and it would have been nice to know beforehand. So, so really, it, it is, you know, it, it takes a village, it is a community of breeders, and you need to work together in that way. Running a little, well, not over time yet, but, but I'm gonna go a little fast on some of the stuff so we can try to finish up on time. So if you have a direct gene test, all you need to do is, is test and you know what you've got. Um, you, you don't need to know anyone else's results, you just need, you know, if you're reading dogs, you test, you get yes, yes, no, whatever, um, in terms of those results. If all you have are phenotypic tests, a hip radiograph, a thyroid profile, linkage tests that could have abnormal results, or no tests for carriers, the knowledge of the test results and carrier effective status of the relatives is important, and that's where that, that vertical pedigree comes into play. Without tests for carriers, you want to breed higher risk individuals to lower risk individuals, replace the higher risk individual with its lower risk offspring, and repeat the process in the next generation. And that requires an open health database where you're reporting, having reporting of that information. So it's very similar to the breed and replace when you have a direct test, but now you're dealing with something called risk rather than an absolute. And that requires something called a relative risk analysis. And, uh, um, and I've used relative risk analysis with several breeds for disorders where we virtually eliminated recessive disorders without ever having a test for, for carriers. And, but it requires a known recessive mode of inheritance, an open health registry, and openness between the breeders and their owners. And so if you have a pedigree where you know who the carriers and the effectives are in the pedigree, you can then calculate what the risk is of a mating of, or, or of an individual or of a mating producing both affected and carriers. And if the researcher can tell you what the average risk for being a carrier is in the population, you want to do matings that are, um, that, um, that are below the average risk of the population. If you keep on breeding below the average, you're going to move away from that disease. It allows breeders with high risk to um, lower their risk. It allows breeders to understand their own risk. And it objectifies risk relative to the population. Um, the cons is that it selects against families based on relatives with risk. So it will select against both carrier and normal dogs. So that, that ugly, genetically normal girl in that pedigree way back when um, is going to have a 66.7% chance of being a carrier being a full sibling to an affected dog. But, but at least it gives you some kind of tool of selection when you have high-risk pedigrees. And Scottish Terrier Club have a disorder that I've worked with with them. They've listed all their effectives on, online on their club website um, and, uh, and so that you, they know where the risk is coming from. And if you go on the Scottish Terrier Club website, they have a relative risk calculator that one of their, their, their people, he asked me what's the formula, and he figured out, he built this calculator, and you can plug it in for any dis what is own recessive disorder you've got. So if you put in there's, there's a full sift to an affected in this position of the pedigree, and a full sift to an affected in this position of the pedigree, it tells you the risk, the carrier risk of the offspring is 4.64%, and the risk of producing affected is 0.05%. Sex link genes, the, um, you can pause when you look at the DVD uh, to read the whole slide, but the bottom line is, if you don't have a test for carriers, you select a normal male and you lose that gene. Males can either be affected or normal, they can't be carriers. The problem with the X-linked disorders that don't have a genetic test is that females that are carriers, half their sons will be affected. Okay, so, so a high-risk female is difficult to breed because, because if they are a carrier, half their sons will be affected. If you breed a normal male, you can take that line and, and eliminate that defective gene in one, in one generation. With polygenic disorders, the last type of disorder to talk about, there's a couple of different things you need to do. You need to identify phenotypic traits tied to the underlying genes. And we'll talk about that in a second. Phenotypic breadth of pedigree provides information on the possible range of genes carried, treat disorders as threshold traits where several genes have to add up and combine and cross a threshold to cause the disease, 
You want to breed normal dogs from mostly normal litters or normal litters. So depth of pedigree is what we, you know, we say three generations of normal, you know, normal hips or thyroids or whatever, but breadth of pedigree is more important actually. So if you have a normal dog and most of its siblings are normal as well, um, you, you should feel comfortable about that. But if you have a normal dog where there's a preponderance of disease in that litter, then you really have to question how much disease liability genes that normal dog has and what it's going to produce in its offspring. Even though you're breeding normal to normal, it's certainly a riskier type of breeding. Phenotypic dis uh, polygenic disorders are threshold traits. A number of genes must combine across a threshold to produce an affected. So if we say theoretically it takes five genes to cause a disease, if you have a mating between an affected dog that has seven genes and a, 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 an unaffected dog with three genes, where the average is, is going to be five, you're not, you can't be surprised that you're producing a lot of disease there. But the other thing, but we're not doing those types of matings very often, the other thing you need to realize is that if two phenotypically normal dogs are bred together and produce an effect with a complex or polygenically inherited disease, both, both parents had to pass on liability genes for that disorder. It wasn't just that damn stud dog. <laughs> okay, so if it was complexly inherited disease, Two phenotypically normal parents bred together, produce an affected, both parents had to pass on liability genes. Now one might have had more than the other, you won't know that until you look at that vertical pedigree, at the depth and breadth of the pedigree. Um, this is from an article in, uh, that we wrote on hip dysplasia, and, and quickly what it showed us was that hip dysplasia is, is an absolutely additive genetic disease. It's a threshold trait with additive genetics. If you, t if you take excellence down to severe in the sire and excellence down to severe in the dam, and then you look at the, the frequency of the disorders of what we do with the combined parent score, so if, if fair is three and good is two and excellence one and moderate six and so forth, if you add up the sire and the dam score, all of the different types of matings that add up to that same score have about the same frequency of dysplasia. And this is based on almost half of a million dogs in the OFA database where both parents also had OFA evaluations. And so I want you to look at one thing here. Severe to moderately affected matings are, are including about 49 dogs here, whereas good to goods is about a quarter of a million dogs. But if you graph this out, it's almost a linear line in terms of of dysplasia based on those ratings. So there is a genetic difference between a fair and a good and an excellent dog. And the only outlier here is that this was based on maybe 60 dogs. So it's not that, that a moderate to a severely affected dog produces more than two severe spread to each other. But hip dysplasia is a completely linear additive disease. If there are no tests for carriers, there's just a couple of slides left. You institute a vertical mating system Replace known carrier or high-risk dogs with a lower risk, um, but with, a qual with quality offspring through plan matings to low-risk mates. Read the quality offspring and replace them with quality offspring. So if there are no tests for carriers, you want to do a less risky mating, produce a quality offspring, and immediately switch your breeding stock to that generation. Then you want to breed to a less, you know, do a less risky mating, produce a quality offspring, and then immediately switch to that offspring. So that you're not doing breed, 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 in that generation, you're trying to breed and lose it with each generation. If you don't produce quality that exceeds the quality of the parent, then you gotta do another breeding. Nobody gets bred out of that, and then, and then you try to produce a better dog. Store semen on dogs and DNA for future analysis, and reintroduce these dogs in the future when a test is available, even if these quality dogs test as carriers. A vertical mating system retains the good genes of your line, it reduces the carrier risk with each generation, and it replaces and does not add to the overall carrier risk in the population. Breeders should use genetic tests to identify carriers, to work to breed away from the defective genes, and prevent the reintroduction of the genes in future breedings. Each breeder must assess their own breeding stock and determine their own rate of progress. Each of you is dealing with something different. Maybe you've got a PRA carrier, a Fanconi carrier, maybe you don't have excellent hips, you've got some fair hips. Um, which, which we know has greater liability in your, in your breed or any breed for, for hip dysplasia. You want to decrease your carrier frequency or carrier risk or liability risk with each generation. A healthy breeding program does not continually multiply carriers. It does not limit the genetic diversity of the population. 
and is geared towards producing quality, genetically normal dogs. Lastly, how can we educate the public? We need to make them more informed consumers of dogs and puppies. We need them to be able to discern who a responsible breeder is. So even if you don't have a litter of puppies, if someone contacts you and asks you, spend some time to talk to them about what they need to look for, what questions they need to ask for. Tell them about CHIP, about the requirements for genetic testing for breeding Basenji and what test results they need to ask for from the breeder. And, if a breed, and tell them that if a breeder has done the tests, they are going to be more than happy to provide them with the, with the written documentation of the official test results. They're not going to say, oh yeah, we did that and we, I got them somewhere or whatever. You know, you have the results of everything and you should be providing with all your puppy packets and paperwork the test results on the parents to show what you have done and that you are a responsible breeder. They need to be knowledgeable about genetic testing. Then this last one, I don't really like it, I leave it on there. Recognize that price and quality should be linked. Um, really, I don't care if you're giving away your dogs. You're creating life. You're creating a family member for, for another family. And I get emotional about this stuff because I see it in my practice. It's something that we need to be doing. We have to be doing this. It's our responsibility. So, so we need to be doing that. Thank you very much.